Reincarnation. India showed us what it's really about. A little pain is good. Reminds us we are alive. India, it's so alive, so soulful. Ayurveda had to be born here. Ayurveda is literally the science of life. Take a sip. Life flows through the air here, healing the body, reawakening the spirit, keeping a culture that's centuries old, forever young. Ayurveda showed us you don't have to wait for reincarnation. You can be reborn in this life. Incredible in So my name is Dr. Maitri Vaidya Sabnis, and I am one of the chief editors along with Dr. Kenneth Robbins, who is also the first speaker of the three lectures that we will be listening to this evening. Uh, may I request uh, uh, Dr. Kenneth X. Robbins to please begin with your uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a fantastic uh, opportunity to work with so many great people. Dr. Maitri, you have been incredible as a scholar and as a colleague and as an advisor and as a guru. And uh, I'd like to thank Bill Richter for all the editing that he's done on these books. Uh, he's a fantastic editor. And David uh, and Ella Good, who's speaking today uh, for their friendship and uh, for their work. The books, as uh, Dr. Maitri said, are available in India, and the digital copies uh, on Amazon, across the world, digitally on Amazon, and hard copies are available on uh, Amazon across the world, except uh, in India where they're going to be available on Pathy. So today we're going to be talking about something from volume one. Maharaja Digvijay Singh. Jam Sahib. This man uh, was not just a Maharaja, he was a cricketer, he was a professional soldier. As you can see in the lower left hand corner, he created a refuge for Polish refugee war orphans. But he also played a big role in terms of representing India in a general sense. As Chancellor of the Chamber of Princes, a ceremonial governor of Saurashtra, and Indian representative of the United Nations. So how does a man come to be, on the one hand, ruler of a small state, a member of the Imperial War Council of the whole British Empire, and then a representative of India in a regional and national sense? Digvijay saw himself as a Hindu leader. He was concerned about the idea of Hinduism in danger, and exhorted other Maharajas to defend Indian and Hindu culture. He defined Indian culture in terms of Hindu values, and he exemplified this by the contributions of Ayurvedic medicine, and he was instrumental in the rededication of Samnath Temple as a symbol of India's eternal resistance to foreign invasion. He was the nephew of his predecessor. His predecessor was Ranjit Singh, who was not only a Jam Sahib of Nawanaga, but he was also a great cricketer. Now, to understand Vig Didjay, and you have to also understand that many of these Maharajas had multiple identities. So let's take start with his uncle, Ranjit Singh. He's been described as a prince of a little state, but king of a great game, cricket. And it's been observed that when you looked at him as an English cricketer, he seemed to be an Indian prince. When you looked at him as an Indian prince, he seemed to be uh, uh, an English cricketer. He seemed to be more English and more Indian than anybody else. But this was a different sort of thing. If you looked at the ways in which he was English, he was a fairy tale princess in a, prince in an age of steam engines, steel bridges, and motor cars. 
Now, to understand how somebody could be switched between being a stalwart of the British Empire and also a nationalist, and how this comes, you have to start to understand Dick Vijay again in terms of his predecessor. Ranjit was citizen of the British Empire. Now, we're going to talk about what that meant. Prince of a small state, king of a great king, and emperor of the good life. Well, we won't be here to talk about the good life, including the huge expenses that he ran up in his uh, fishing lodges and his purchase of jewelry. But he was not an ornament to the British. You know, when we think about the princes, and we too have, have really talked about ornamentalism, the way in which this was, uh, the British Empire was a construction not only of power, but of, uh, of uh, durbars and, uh, and meetings between viceroys and maharajas and all sorts of uh, titles and things like that. But he was also an active participant in the British Empire. He didn't see his role as being subservient. He thought he would continue to have a role, which would be to govern his state and his, that his successors would continue to govern his state and he would not lose, and they would not lose power, but he also saw himself as part of something greater. Raji was also at the League of Nations, at the Round Table, and he was Chancellor ahead of the Chamber of Princes. So what was this Chamber of Princes? When we see people talking about this, it arose after World War I, and one can see the conference that led, led to it, and uh, one sees uh, Ranji, Ranji uh, in the first row, in the first on the left-hand side. And you see the Viceroy in the middle, surrounded by the Maharaja of Jaipur and the Begum of Bhopal. One of the things that you notice is that there is not much attendance of the greatest states, in this, even in this meeting. So one of the things that you see with the Chamber of Princes is that it reflected the differing interests of small, medium, and large states. This wasn't only the question that the British limited the powers of the Chamber to deliberations, but that the large states did not really participate and the small states were constantly complaining that their interests were not uh, represented. The four greatest leaders of the Chamber of Princes all came from fully powered mid-level states. They were Ganga Singh of Bikaneer, the Maharaja of, of Patiala, and two Jam Sahibs of Dawanaga, Ranji and his nephew Digvijay, who we're talking about today. Only one of the Maharajas from the greatest states, five greatest states, played a prominent role in the Chamber of Princes. He died in 1925. And the Nizam said, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna have anything affected, affecting my state be determined by the advice of other ruling princes, and so on and so forth. Raji was very concerned and vocal about British disregard of their rights and pledges and so on and so forth. And the way in which the British went after his port revenues and customs prerogatives and other things and so on and so forth. The princes in this way relied upon dealing with these things as if they were legal matters. So they would get advice from lawyers like Leslie Scott, so Leslie Scott, uh, that, uh, and um, who were concerned that the protections for the princes in the states were likely to be only paper safeguards. And that there had to be a right to appeal not only against the new federal government, but against the crown itself. We're talking about pre-independence times now. But in any independent state, if the cut with Britain was uh, eliminated, how were the rights of the states to be protected? 
when Digvijay came in, and there he is in the left-hand side with Gandhar Singh, a beginner, he had a steadying influence as chancellor. And just before World War One and into World uh, for World War Two and into the World War Two period, but the climate had changed. The princes no longer held as much veto power over the emerging Indian uh, the, the emerging Indian polities that were to emerge. Uh, on the other hand, Digvijay supported the admission of some smaller states and uh, he attracted the interest of other states, including some of the larger states. But look at this. I mean, you could herd cats, but how do you want a deliberative body made up of Maharajas and Nawabs? And most of the most important states were never members or left. Tigvijay was as effective as far as he could. He brought in some new states, even got people to pay their dues, even if they didn't show up for meetings and so on and so forth. And he promoted expert committees and got a, uh, a promise from the Viceroy that the British would consider the Chamber of Princes representations on bills economically affecting the states and so on and so forth. So if you look at this in the 1930s and early 1940s, this cartoon expresses it all. Were they going to be, where were the princes going to go? What's direction? Were they going to be in federations, confederations? Were they going to be autocracy on their own and so on and so forth? And you could see that there wasn't any clear answer that was likely to work. At the time of independence, several things had happened. Vijay himself had moved from a position uh, helping the war effort for the British to protecting the rights of the princes and so on and so forth. In terms of what was going on in, in Gujarat, many of the smaller states had been attached to larger states like his. The attachment scheme of 1943 added almost 100,000 people to his administration. Uh, this included two states and 11 jurisdictional Toluca's, etc. So the British had turned over the functions of paramountcy to the larger states. However, the small states kept on saying to the larger states, look, if the British could turn over our paramountcy to you, that means that the British could turn over their paramountcy of you and suzerainty to an independent India. Yet Vigijay was an early signer of the instrument of accession to newly independent India. He was the named ceremonial governor of Saurashtra, which included many states. And through his actions on the rededication of the Samnath Temple, he played a large role in forcing the image of an eternal India freed of foreign and Muslim rule. He played a key role in the transformation of Western India as a unified part of newly independent India. So look at this. We've gone through six lectures and three books talking about how divided this area was. Hundreds and hundreds of states. Was it 200 states, 400 states? You, you, can't, you can't even imagine how divided this was. At the time that everybody talks about partition of India, all of this magically comes together. And it comes together rather quickly. As late as April of 1947, Digvijay was trying to make a plan for a confederation of almost 50 states in Western India, Rajputana, and Central India. But large states like Baroda and Junagar were not included. This would have created an entity based on not contiguous parcels of land. In other words, the problem that we had before was that places like Baroda and Chudagar were made up of hundreds and hundreds of disconnected parcels of land interspersed with all sorts of other jurisdictions. This could not work. Less than a year later, Digvijay was involved as the ceremonial governor of the United States of Kathiawar. 
is a basically quick transformation. As I said before, he saw himself as a Hindu leader and he saw, he saw Samnath and promotion of Ayurveda as being very important in that. To promote Ayurvedic medicine, he published a classical Hindu text, the Shakara Sabhita. And to see how important this was, the copy that I own of the seven volumes was actually used by a doctor. And you can see his handwritten notes about the different uh, plants. So the project was based on the belief that India's racial and cultural integrity and soundness are the fruits of deep interest in the science and art of healing. So this was a book that was redacted about 2000 years ago from early authorities. The volumes include a history of medicine and life 2,000 years ago in India, and a discussion of the philosophical concepts, like the rational approach to causation and treatment and objective met methods of clinical practice. This is a focus on a model for India that it could have a pluralistic judgment to everything, that you could have a state that drew upon traditional Indian values, Indian philosophy, Indian sciences, and yet also include other things. There was medical pluralism as a norm in states like, uh, in places like Javnagar. And that Yayurveda with its firm grasp of the roots of life was an eternal touchstone for evaluation of newer findings in the field of, uh, of, of health. The new revival in India's art lectures, its aspirations for political independence arise naturally in India's natural interest in their past medical history and achievements. That India's past was not something just of antiquarian interest, but was replete with suggestions and possibilities for the future. Part of this revival of the Indian tradition was the emphasis on a temple, Samnath, which was in the territory of a Muslim Nawab who tried to accede to Pakistan, even though he was, his area was not contiguous with Pakistan and most of his population was Hindu. People like the writer K. M. Munchi had first in the, forced in the image of this temple as a symbol of national unity, of Hindu resistance, an eternal self-regenerating presence that he had been destroyed multiple times by Muslim invaders, but it would last as India was eternal. Kalpi, the poet Prince of Lathi, wrote a historical epic about his ancestor, dying, defending, Sabnath Temple against the Kilgis in 1299. Even the British got into the act, bringing back what they, from Afghanistan, what they claim were the gates of Sabnath, what they claim were the gates of Sabnath. Over and over again, this became the symbol of Indian national unity. Samnath was a symbol of national pride that kept on regenerating. And it was on the same foundations as temple 2000 years ago and so on and so forth. And after the Nawab of Judagar fled and Indian troops entered Judagar, people like the Vijay at Sardar Patel could achieve their dream of temple reconstruction and restoration of Hindu honor. Digvijay was the chairman of trustees and he laid the foundation for the new temple on the site. And he saw the deity there as representing India universally and asked for, you know, for soil and twigs and so on and so forth from all over India. In 2001, 
the Prime Minister of India gave a speech at the Golden Jubilee celebration for the sanctification of the of this temple's linga. And he exclaimed that Somnath was a symbol of India's national respect, timeless culture, external religion, way of life, and continuing struggle against those who raised it to the ground. This image of the centrality of Somnath and of traditional Hindi values and learning, which has been so part of so much a part of the uh, of Indian nationalism today, has its roots in the beliefs and practices of people like the Vijay Singh of Jamnaga, the Jam Sahib cricketer. Thank you very much. Maitri? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robbins. So I have to tell this about him, that uh, he is an independent scholar, and uh, as I'm sure all of you must have gathered, an archivist, a collector, who has curated many exhibits and scholarly conferences, dealing with Maharajas and Nawabs in Indian history, paintings, photographs, art, religion, medicine, etc. I have to say that he calls me his guru, but then this is the case where the disciple is a greater teacher than the guru. Huh. He has, as he said, stirred up a storm through these volumes. He's planning to edit volumes covering all the princely states and is already preparing separate volumes on Mewar, the Deccan states, and also what he calls as medical pluralism. He's in the process of assembling material for a pictorial history of international crises from 1880 to 1930. And I'm sure that he will continue to work as far as he can. I am deeply grateful to you, dear friend, and I'm proud to say that you truly are my inspiration and I hope to work like you till I can. Thank you. Uh, with this, we move on to the next lecture. So uh, we talk about the books and uh, the three volumes are a compilation of articles which address the ways in which history can be revised. Through these books, an attempt is made to bring the princely states or Indian states into mainstream historical discourse of modern India. It is an answer to questions like, why do we need to study about the history of princely states? These Indian states have been unforgotten despite the fact that they had dominated nearly half of the Indian subcontinent. For the most part, they were treated as mere pawns by the colonial power and sidelined by the Indian national movement. The politically acceptable parts of the past of regional states have been found in the histories or that of reforms carried out by the state administration. The Rajas or kings themselves and their families, however, have been mostly neglected. Even in the studies of the colonial period, the rulers are often depicted as powerless, self-indulgent, occasionally amusing, eccentric, of a little political significance or social consequence. They are truly the people without history, whose role historians are little less inclined to address. The abolition of these Indian states soon after independence and later, that is around 1971, the abolition of their privy purses, uh, sometimes which has been described as pensions, has further thrown the histories into oblivion. However, as we already know now, the royal families, formal, former royal families still exist. And as we also saw in one or two lectures, are striving to save their lost tradition and histories. Many have moved into business or politics. Within the states, the people of the princely states still discuss and remember them. A great many ceremonial and ritual occasions still require their presence. And in many parts of India, a link to royalty, no matter how little, is still often used and valued. Politicians and leaders in various walks of life seek to imitate them and employ kingly symbols, discourses, and inst instruments of patronage. 
thereby making the royal families more relevant than ever. So today's session, we uh, in fact reach to a culmination of a very important chapter in Gujarat history. And in connection with that, the next lecture becomes extremely relevant. Uh, this is the lecture is by William Richter. He is a professor emeritus of political science and also a former associate provost for international programs at the Kansas State University. So he is also the uh, one of the editors of the book and I have to say quite a strict one at that because uh, no matter what uh, explanations we would give, he would just not be convinced. So unless and until we convinced him, he would not let that pass. So I think we are, I'm very grateful to you. I can say this on behalf of the entire team for uh, your insights, your inputs. And uh, I think uh, we all did a tremendous job, but you just put us in line. So thank you very much, Professor Richter. And now I welcome you to please deliver your lecture. Many thanks, Matre, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks to both you and Ken and all others who've been involved in putting these three volumes together and uh, on the history and heritage of Prince the Gujarat. Uh, I want also to thank those who've made possible this international lecture series, the Asiatic Society of Mumbai for organizing and hosting the series and to Tourism India for its sponsorship for making the lectures accessible to all of us without charge. I, I greatly enjoyed Ken's presentation. Uh, I, I always learn something when you speak, Ken, and uh, it is uh, uh, even even if it's on a subject that I've had the opportunity to read before. There's uh, you have a, a great ability to uh, convey the the spirit as well as the content of the uh, subject that you're dealing with. Uh, it's been a great honor and pleasure for me to be associated with this project. Uh, I enjoyed reading all the chapters, as Maitri mentioned. I tried not to be uh, 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 domineering as, uh, as an editor. All of my editorial comments, I think, were suggestions. And uh, so I, I really left it up to you and Ken to uh, decide whether those suggestions were legitimate or not. At least I intended to. My chapter in volume one is perhaps the most peripheral to the central focus of this project. Uh, the title includes the dates 1800 to 1950, whereas most of what I deal with takes place after 1950. Uh, most of the other chapters deal with the Indian states and what was called princely India, uh, but mine I like to think of as post princely, or at least uh, a something that follows on the, the major content of, of these volumes. I look at the transformation of princes into politicians, as uh, Lloyd and Suzanne Rudolph phrased it in a title of an unpublished book manuscript. Which rulers and members of their families made that transition and how did they happen to make it? Uh, the, uh, I, and I'd like to sort of begin by <coughs> sharing with you a bit of my own personal history related to this uh, subject. When my wife and I were first in India in 1965, I was doing doctoral research on Indian language politics. Uh, we happened to be wandering through Kanat uh, Circus and I found a paperback copy of VP Menon's book, The Story of the Integration of the Indian States. We bought it, read it, and I was fascinated by the, the story of the end of of the independent princely states uh, of India. And I wondered what had happened to the former rulers and their families. When I looked at uh, history books and other commentary on the subject, they generally suggested that uh, the former rulers had simply faded into obscurity, had, had gone their separate ways, uh, much as that cartoon that Ken showed a few moments ago uh, illustrated. But I knew that several were uh, active in politics. And so I, uh, as soon as I completed my doctoral degree, I shifted attention from language to princes. Uh, and uh, I was interested in looking at this on an all India basis, uh, which makes it a rather vast subject given the, the number of former princely states throughout India. So I limited my study to the 284 princely families 
who continued to receive privy purses after integration and up until 1971. We returned to India in 1969-70 on a Fulbright lectureship and uh, in 1972-73 on an American Institute of Indian Studies uh, research fellowship to explore this study. And I'm, I'm grateful to the many former rulers and members of their families whom I had the privilege of meeting and interviewing during that time, but especially to His Highness Sri Raj Megaraji of Drangadra who was a mentor and friend, as well as a valuable source of information, insights, and contacts. And it was just a delight for me yesterday uh, to listen to uh, the present Maharaja of Drangadra, uh, Jayavapa, uh, make his presentation on uh, the history of the Jala dynasty. We intended to return to India in 1976-77 to do more work uh, on Rajvanshis or members of, of princely families in Indian elections. But India was in the midst of the emergency and declined to issue us research visas. I think they just didn't want people looking at elections during that period. Uh, so my wife ended up doing her doctoral research on the Philippines instead, and I shifted my research attention to Pakistan and more specifically to the political history of Bahalpur, the largest of the princely states that acceded to Pakistan. During the next three decades, my writing agenda shifted further, leaving my research on Indian princes in politics, languishing in file drawers and on bookshelves. It's been a great joy for me in retirement to return to those materials, to update them and to engage with scholars like those involved with this series of books and all of you participating in this uh, lecture series. So what I would like to do in the remainder of the time that I have is, is simply to touch on some of the major themes that I uh, think are included in the chapter that I have in volume one. And the first is one that uh, Maitri just uh, referred to, and that is the relative scholarly neglect of princely India and of Gujarat uh, in uh, the uh, in the literature. Princely India is, is relatively neglected compared with British India. Uh, and I would argue that that imbalance uh, of scholarly attention has continued after independence. In other words, I think that even looking at contemporary uh, politics, uh, there's a lot more work done on UP than on uh, Rajasthan or uh, Gujarat or Madhya Pradesh or and so forth. But I would I think it's also interesting that princely Gujarat is relatively neglected compared with other princely areas. If you look at uh, what information does exist on princely India, Rajasthan always seems to be the, the most prominent, but probably then Madhya Pradesh and Odisha uh, and uh, 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 one has to go down the list a while before you get to uh, Gujarat. This is despite the fact that roughly two thirds of the approximately 550 units of princely territory uh, that existed prior to integration uh, were in what is today Gujarat. And uh, similarly, a significant number of those 284 states that I uh, looked at as a part of the, the study that I was doing in the early 70s uh, are in Gujarat. Also, a uh, uh, second point I would make is that the princely areas have a more complex political heritage than elsewhere, uh, at least than, than most of the rest of princely India. Uh, when Rajasthan was pulled together, for instance, uh, the, uh, it has largely stayed in much the same shape uh, and size as uh, uh, occurred immediately after uh, independence and integration. Uh, however, as Ken alluded to, uh, parts of Gujarat remained uh, separate in the early years. Uh, the separate states of uh, uh, Saurashtra and Kutch and, and then the, the uh, other princely states were absorbed into Bombay uh, state. Uh, then, uh, after between 1956 and 1960, the merger of Kutch and, and Saurashtra into Bombay, and then after 1960, the 
separate existence of Gujarat as a uh, as a state within the Indian Union. And since much of what happens in politics depends upon the political context that that it occurs within, this has meant uh, uh, a somewhat disjunctive or uh, changing scene uh, for the uh, former uh, princely families of uh, Gujarat. Uh, a third topic that, uh, and probably the core uh, issue here is uh, uh, the involvement of members of princely families or Rajvanchis uh, in uh, electoral politics. Uh, in order to look at, at political uh, involvement, I primarily looked at uh, those individuals who stood for election to the Lok Sabha or uh, to Vidhan Sabha, uh, uh, legislative assemblies in the various states. Uh, and uh, when you look at that, you'll find that uh, there is a, uh, uh, you, it appears that there's less participation in politics in Gujarat than there is in some of the other areas like uh, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, or Rajasthan. Uh, but that is in part a function of there being so many small states in, in Gujarat. The, what I'd like to do is to share a um, screen with, oh, let's see. Oop. I'm not sharing the screen. Oh, yes, here we go. Oh, there. Okay. Um, yeah, what, uh, what I am showing you here is a, is a table from the chapter in which uh, I'm, uh, we simply look at the participation levels in the various parts of Gujarat. But Saurashtra includes Saurashtra and Kutch uh, in this table. And uh, the uh, essentially are two dimensions. One is a comparison of Saurashtra with the rest of Gujarat, uh, with those parts of Gujarat that became a part of Bombay uh, state uh, at, after integration. And the other dimension is a comparison of size. Of uh, I use a fairly crude measure of of importance, which is gun salutes. And so uh, what you can see is that uh, there is more participation uh, of uh, uh, royal families in Saurashtra uh, than there is in the rest of Gujarat. Uh, and, there, and as you get larger, the larger the state or the, the more prestigious the state in terms of gun salutes, uh, the higher the level of, uh, of political participation. This, uh, uh, we should not simply assume that, that uh, bigger states generally are uh, necessarily more active politically. As Ken mentioned uh, a moment ago, in the Chamber of Princes, some of the larger states uh, and, and more prestigious states did not participate. That is true in politics now. If, if we broke this table down into much more, uh, if we compared, for instance, each of the gun levels, uh, salute levels, what we'd see is sort of a, a topping out. Uh, the highest levels of participation are among, at least this on an all India basis, are among the 15 and 17 gun salute states. Uh, it tends to drop off among the, the larger states, and there are various reasons for that that I, I won't uh, go into at this point. What I, so I'm going to uh, stop my sharing here and um, return to my commentary. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Yeah, one, one, you know, take into effect other considerations uh, uh, besides uh, size. Size is important because it implies resources. Uh, 
the larger the states, the more uh, the more financial resources, uh, but also the more former subjects there are uh, who are loyal to the uh, to the former ruler and and can uh, can be uh, uh, can help to elect them to political office. But there are all sorts of other personal and psychological factors. I think that that uh, some of the larger uh, princes were not interested in standing for office in part because there's a certain there's a certain risk. Uh, what if you uh, what if you stand for office and lose? Uh, are you in risk of, of uh, uh, losing some of your honor and, and prestige? There are also opportunity costs and uh, and recruitment patterns that have that affect the participation levels of rulers in uh, in politics. Uh, yesterday and 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 today in Ken's comments, uh, uh, Jala mentioned that his father uh, served as Upraj Pramukh of Saurashtra, and. Uh, 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 Ken mentioned that uh, the uh, Jamsab of Navanagar served as a Rajpramukh of, of Saurashtra. Many of the most prestigious rulers of, uh, uh, in India were effectively excluded from electoral politics until 1956 by being appointed uh, to these uh, offices of Rajpramukh and Uprajpramukh in, in the various states' unions. Um, when we talk about recruitment, uh, it's you know it's important to recognize that people stand for office not just because they decide they want to be in politics, uh, but uh, also because other people persuade them to do so. Uh, and if we look at the in Gujarat as well as elsewhere, there's a general pattern again, not absolute. But in the first general elections, many of the rulers and families who stood for elections were self-motivated. Uh, that is, they, they did decide that they wanted to uh, get into politics and they stood as independents. By the second general elections, uh, there's a much more common pattern of uh, Congress party recruitment. That is Prime Ministers Nehru, Shastri, Indira Gandhi, uh, various chief ministers, all engaged in encouraging former rulers to serve India by standing for office as Congress candidates. Uh, they, uh, many of the, the, the uh, princely politicians whom I interviewed and uh, would mention that, uh, you know, Ravi Shankar Shukla came to me and said, uh, we need you to stand uh, and help us uh, uh, serve this country and so forth. Um, by the third general election in 1962, opposition party recruitment uh, was more prominent, especially by Swatantra. Uh, and uh, that, in fact, uh, the, the growing participation of, uh, of uh, ruling families in the, in the uh, uh, electoral scene was, prob was one of the major factors, I believe, that uh, led to the Privy Purse controversy starting in about 1967 and to the Constitutional Amendment 1971 that uh, Maitri referred to a few minutes ago. Family factors are also important, and I deal with that a bit in the chapter. Uh, the, the, these are not just immediate family relations of spouses, brothers, offspring, uh, standing for office but more historical linkages as well. For me, the most interesting one is a link that I discovered several years ago uh, uh, of the politically active grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and other descendants of Saiji Rao III of Baroda. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this, in some ways, this is not just the Baroda family, uh, but a broader phenomenon where descendants of prominent princely leaders, such as chancellors of the Chamber of Princes, inherit a tradition of active engagement that both encourages and legitimizes their own uh, political involvement. Finally, the chapter touches on a type of political involvement other than electoral candidacy, 
Uh, I refer to this as the organizational leadership shown in mobilizing resistance nationally and regionally to the threat of to princely privileges and incomes during the Privy Purse controversy. Uh, as I mentioned, roughly 1967 to 1971. Uh, that it's interesting that the two uh, major figures uh, in uh, the what was called the Concord, uh, more formally, the name was the Consultation of Rulers in Concord for India, were uh, the uh, were two of the people mentioned yesterday by Jayababa. Uh, namely his father and his uncle, uh, Suraj Megraji of Drangadra and Fatih Singh Rao Gaikwad of Baroda. Uh, uh, his Highness Drangadra was the uh, intendant general, essentially the uh, executive uh, director of the Concord, and uh, uh, Fatih Singh Rao was the convener general, or uh, in effect, the, the president. But I think that it's from, uh, it appears to me that uh, His Highness Drangadra was very much the driving force behind this endeavor. Uh, it reflected his scholarly interests, <coughs> excuse me, and devotion to princely heritage as well as a response to immediate political threats. This is a subject that I think deserves a lot more scholarly attention. And I hope that some of you who are historians and, and present today, will find this an attractive area to research. Uh, I, uh, as my, the, the main point that I would make concerning that is that although this was an organization that arose at a specific point in time, I think its roots uh, lie much uh, deeper uh, into the, uh, the pre-independence period uh, and into uh, the traditions of the princely states than, than was given uh, the impression in the press. The chapter concludes with the following observation. Princely India continues to cast long shadows in the 21st century. Gujarati princes continue to be a part of that heritage. I'm glad that uh, Jayapapa and Angma and other members of the princely order have been uh, such a valuable part of, uh, of our uh, week here together, our two weeks together, uh, and of this book project and lecture series. And uh, again, I thank you all for uh, having the privilege of being a part of it myself. I turn this back to you, I guess, uh, to uh, uh, Maitri. So uh, thank you very much for your... Uh very interesting uh, lecture and I hope that uh, it has generated some interest in the uh, audience today and uh, let us hope that if you want to know about greater details you'll have to buy our books which are available on amazon.in and also will be available from pothi.com. So now we move towards the uh, next session uh, which is our next lecture in fact uh, this is the lecture is uh, I think it's the final lecture of today. And I think uh, there's also one thing that uh, Ken has suggested and I agree totally with him, but that will follow once we have this very interesting lecture by uh, David P. Good and Ila Good. So so uh, just a bit about, uh, I, I think uh, Ken would be able to introduce our next speaker, but I'll just uh, briefly introduce him before uh, Ken does uh, talk about uh, uh, you in a greater detail. So uh, David P. Good is a retired foreign service officer with extensive experience in both uh, India and Middle East. So he in fact has traveled a lot uh, in India and uh, his final posting was as U.S. Council General in the city uh, that is in Mumbai from 1999 to 2002. Uh, he's also served in Abu Dhabi and uh, other parts of the world. And following his retirement, uh, he represented the Indian firm Tata Sons in North America from 2005 to 2010. And he continues to pursue an active interest in association with India where he travels frequently. So uh, today he's going to speak on uh, Vakaner House. So just before we began today's session, 
uh, uh, I think they were talking about uh, the Vakaner House. So I think Ken, would you like to uh, just introduce uh, Ela Good? Because she's also another chief speaker. Yes, well, let me just say something about Ela. Ela is a, most a self-facing. She's a fantastic writer uh, and uh, her article in the book about uh, Kalapi, uh, I think is an eye opener for people. Uh, she has a background, her family is Gujarati uh, with roots in places like Wankaneer. So this person who has some family roots in Wankaneer wound up living in Wankaneer house as the wife of the uh, American diplomatic representative. And um, frankly, they are very, very close friends and. Uh, and David is my partner in crime, buying things, ephemera and things that nobody else wants. Thank you. Okay, so may I please invite uh, both of you to please deliver your lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Maitri and uh, Ken and Bill. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, we are neither historians nor scholars, but we do have this peripheral connection to the uh, the uh, royal states, the princely states of Gujarat. And that is because we did live in the Wankaner house in the palace of the Maharana of Wankaner in Mumbai. And of course, uh, Ila, my wife uh, is a daughter of Wankaner, which uh, she will then talk a little bit about later on. And it was a real privilege for us to have that opportunity of speaking, of uh, living in, uh, in that palace for the three years that I was consul general in the city. Um, it's a particular pleasure to be here uh, sharing the screen with uh, our very close friend, uh, Ken Robbins, whom I first met in Mumbai when I was Consul General. And uh, little did I know that that lunch that we shared together all those many 20, 21 years ago, you know, would turn into such a close friendship as we share right now. Uh, but let me give you just a, let me start and then I'm going to let uh, Ela sort of speak about, uh, you know, her own feelings about being a part of Wonkin Air House. Give you a little bit of the background uh, of some of the royal palaces in Mumbai. It was a very usual thing, as I understand it, for many of the princely states in, uh, in Western India to have uh, palaces and to have city residences in Mumbai because it was important for them whenever they wanted to come and visit the big city then they wanted to have a comfortable little place to stay. And so they, there were many of these palaces that were built in different parts of the city, especially along the coastline in what's called the Breach Candy, the Breach Candy area of, uh, of Mumbai on a on street, which is called the Bulabai Desai uh, Road, uh, but which is uh, really known locally as the Breach Candy area. The, the one building which I think has sort of fared the best during that time is the, is the Wankaner House, the palace built by the, uh, the Maharana of Wankaner in, I understand, in I believe 19, 1933, I believe he had it built. And it was designed by Claude Bailey, one of the main, uh, the most important British architects at the time and was actually built by Shapurji Palonji Company, which is still in existence in Mumbai and who I understand sort of built most of the really significant buildings in Mumbai over the last 50 or 60 years. In fact, in the lobby of the consulate, the lobby of the building, uh, Lincoln Air House, which we as Americans always called Lincoln House. And it was always kind of a struggle with me sometime when I was introducing our uh, visitors from Washington to continue to refer to our residence as Lincoln House when everything in my sort of heart in my head told me that it was Wankin Air House. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, it was still the same building. And in the lobby of that building, as you entered, there used to be a framed copy of the architect's drawing by Claude Bailey and Shapurji Palonji of the original building uh, as it was opened in 1933. Uh, well, the Maharaja lived there uh, off and on from Wankin Air for about uh, 15 years or about 20 some years. And, not unlike many of the other Maharajas, and I think that uh, Bill Victor could certainly speak to this, uh, once the, the Indian income tax schemes began to be implemented against the Maharajas and they lost their ability to sort of uh, remain outside of the tax structure, they all began to sort of think about how they could raise funds and they began to think about how they can divest the properties. 
the Americans took advantage of that in uh, 1957, I believe, and actually bought the property from the Maharaj of uh, Maharana of Wankaner uh, for the princely sum of, I believe, 18 lakhs of rupees, which I believe was about $360,000 at the time. So it was not an insignificant, uh, insignificant uh, sum. Actually, I, know, I think 360,000 perhaps now. So it was uh, not an insignificant sum at the time, but looking back on it, it was certainly a great bargain. I could say that at that time, uh, the Americans acquired a lot of property soon after independence, not only in Mumbai, uh, but also in Delhi. In fact, some of the very choicest properties that the uh, US uh, embassy in Delhi uh, possess right now in, uh, in New Delhi actually were purchased in those years after uh, Indian independence. When, uh, when they were available from people, either royal families who were leaving, uh, leaving Delhi and needed to raise uh, cash or perhaps from, uh, from other families who saw it as an opportunity of sort of make some money. So there are a lot of really lovely properties that belong to the US government in New Delhi. No longer in Mumbai, the three properties that we had in Mumbai are no longer uh, controlled by the Americans, even though, as I'll mention later, Lankan Air House is still technically owned by the Americans, but uh, is, is, is disputed. If I could just digress for one moment here, and I, I first and I say that I first came to India in 1971, when I was a junior officer in the American embassy in New Delhi. And my office at that time was in another princely uh, uh, residence called Bahawalpur House, which had been built by the, uh, by the ruler of Bahawalpur, and then uh, left behind uh, when that ruler, as I understand it, sort of went off to Pakistan. But that building was then taken over by the government of India and was leased to the Americans as the American Cultural Center and Library. And so as the, the most junior officer in that building, my office uh, in Bahawalpur House was actually in the royal bathroom, which was actually a, a very lovely sort of marble-lined uh, antechamber to the actual uh, bathroom. And there were two or three desks set up there. And so that was my first office. And I can also then say that my final office in India in uh, 2002 was in the Royal Palace of, uh, of Wankaner in uh, Mumbai. So I began my, my India career in the Royal Bathrooms of the Hawalpur in Delhi and ended it in the Royal Palace of Wankaner in uh, Mumbai. Um, but when I was first uh, given the I'm told that I would be coming to uh, to Mumbai as Consul General, it was very exciting for me because I love all of these old buildings. I've always loved the old heritage buildings of India, and I was particularly excited by the fact that uh, uh, that there was a cannon in the front of the of the house in Wankaner House. It was uh, something that would have been apparently uh, an old uh, maybe British or Portuguese. Uh, cannon that had been dug up when the foundations of Wankaner were being dug and they found the cannon and set it up in front of the residence and remains there to this day. And I was very excited about the idea from my childhood fantasies as you know, playing soldier while well, growing up that here I was in a house, not only in a palace, but one that had a cannon in the front of it. When, when we first moved into uh, to uh, Lincoln House, Wankan Air House, I was very, very interested in kind of exploring what was what remained of the of the old Wankan Air uh, uh, residence. And I wandered all over the house, uh, all of the different floors, looking for secret passages and maybe sort of secret treasure troves that might have been left behind um, by the Maharana, but uh, unfortunately couldn't find anything that hadn't already been explored by, uh, by US government architects in the years uh, since then. Uh, it was a wonderful place to live. Uh, uh, my wife can sort of talk about some of the personal uh, uh, pleasures that we had uh, from being there. Uh, but I might add that uh, the, the, at that time, the Rajkumar of Wankaner, Digby Jay Singh, his father, the Maharana, had, was still living at that time, and I think was already in his 90s. But Digby Jay Singh used to always call on the new consul general, you know, just to sort of welcome us to to his uh, former home and to tell us and to invite us to visit uh, the palace, the current palace in Wankaner, uh, which we did on more than one occasion and always were very uh, warmly received by uh, Digby Jay Singh and we had the, and his wife Biba, and we did have the opportunity of, of uh, meeting the, the Maharan at that time, even in his 90s. 
uh, one of the aspects of the palace in Wankanir, which is sort of worth mentioning, is that as you enter the palace, in the main foyer, in the main uh, room as you enter, is a silver, solid silver replica of Wankanir House in Mumbai that, as we were told, was presented to the Maharana by the grateful residents of uh, Wankanir. And you can sort of see it there to this day if you go to Wankanir, a faithful replica in silver of the palace in Mumbai. Uh, we lived there for three years. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. We had many, many uh, receptions and parties in the grounds behind the, uh, the consulate. And uh, I remember one in particular when we had a visiting congressman, a member of Congress, uh, who sort of looking, uh, in the, looking over the beautiful building in which we were living and in which the consulate was located, uh, turned around and told our, our visiting uh, guests that yes, yes, it must be difficult, very difficult to live in public housing, which of course it was since it belonged to the uh, US government and uh, public housing it was, but uh, luxurious it also was. Uh, probably one of the, the highlights of being in uh, of our time during the three years, there was the visit of uh, President Clinton. Now, some people think that uh, President Clinton came to uh, Lincoln House, Wankanera House, while he was president, but that's not the case. He, he, he came to Mumbai as president on a very triumphant, very successful visit to India in 2001. But the Secret Service came and looked at the, uh, looked at the building, looked at the consulate building, and decided that this, uh, there was no way that a sitting president was going to be allowed to, to uh, show himself in that building and to meet people in the back of the uh, open courtyard, uh, the open uh, uh, grounds in the back of the building, because by this time, the palace, which had, when it was built, was sort of sat by itself in, uh, uh, along the coastline, now was surrounded by high-rise buildings, and there was no way that the Secret Service could uh, secure those buildings, uh, and so they decided that it was impossible for the President of the United States to sort of be, to show himself in any way in the, in the grounds of that building, it would be too dangerous. Uh, he did, however, come as an ex-president. So after he had left office in 2001, he did visit uh, Mumbai again in 2002, and we prevailed upon him to come to, uh, to Wankanere House in order to meet the staff. And he did that very graciously, spent an hour uh, meeting with uh, the American and the Indian uh, staff in, in the ground behind Wankanere House. And, uh, and actually waving to the, the many, many uh, sort of people standing on their balconies and those, those tall uh, high-rise buildings surrounding the consulate. And they were shouting at him and cheering him and he very kindly waved at them and, <laughs> and said that he was very glad to have that opportunity of coming. And it was clear that the Secret Service saw much less risk in an ex-president exposing himself in that way than they did a, a sitting president. Um, we left in 2002 uh, and uh, gave way to another consul general and uh, fortunately the next consul general and even the consul general after, after him uh, were able to spend a full three years living in uh, the same building. Uh, but it was soon after that, around 2010, that the consulate really outgrew its, uh, uh, its, uh, the ability to sort of provide its services in that small space and they decided that they had to move out to a larger space and a more secure space and, uh, and around 2010, 2011, uh, the consulate moved to its present location in Bandakurla, uh, which is further away from South Bombay, but it certainly has a much, uh, much larger space and a more uh, facility to serve the, uh, the uh, Indian public, especially those who are coming for visas. An indication of just how, uh, how much the, the work of the consulate has expanded. Uh, during, during our time in Mumbai, I believe that there were about 25 officers who were uh, serving in the American officers serving in the, in the consulate. Now I believe the number is something between 80 and 90, most of whom are actually visa officers and uh, serving the very sort of uh, busy uh, visa, visa business, uh, providing uh, visas to Indians uh, traveling to the United States, as well as serving the expanding American business community in Mumbai. Uh, 
Although the consulate is moved, the consulate is now in Banda Kurla. Uh, Bancanera House itself uh, still stands, uh, semi-derelict and certainly empty, uh, where it used to along the uh, the seaside and the beach candy. Uh, a few years ago, it was announced that the Punawala family in Pune, uh, the owners uh, in, of the Serum Institute, uh, which has been so prominent lately in providing the uh, the uh, vaccinations uh, for uh, COVID in India and other places in the world, had actually purchased the property for what we understand is uh, 700 uh, or 75 or 750 crores of uh, rupees, something in the neighborhood of about $100 million. But they still haven't been able to take possession of the building because the uh, government of India has still not given permission for that uh, sale to finally take place. So the ownership of uh, Wankanera House remains in American hands, but we've not been able to complete a sale to the Punawala family until permission is finally granted. Uh, I made some inquiries just recently while I was in India. I spoke to a friend of mine who's actually working at the consulate in Mumbai now, and he told me that it's still raised with the government of India from time to time, and questions are asked about why that permission hasn't been granted. Um, but uh, the reality is that, uh, that it probably will never be granted until there is some kind of quid pro quo, uh, which is created. Perhaps one day the government of India will want to purchase another property in the United States, or they'll want to open a new consulate. Or there'll be some kind of a reason to provide a quid pro quo, uh, whereby uh, we will finally be allowed to, to consummate that sale to the Punawala family and the Indians will then be allowed to make whatever purchase they might be interested in in the future. Um, the fine, so the final disposition of Wankan Air House is still up in the air. Um, the factors surrounding the difficulty perhaps in disposing of that property remain in two. One is that the, uh, the building is given the uh, status of a heritage property in Mumbai, which means it, it can never be torn down, it can never be sort of renovated in a way that would change the basic character of the building. Uh, it's also uh, located uh, within a certain distance from the shoreline and the rules in either Mumbai or Maharashtra, I'm not sure which, are that no new buildings can be built within I think 100 meters or 200 meters or something like that of the shoreline uh, in Mumbai. And so that leaves virtually no opportunity for someone to buy the property and build a high rise there. So whoever buys that property, be it the Pune Wallet or whether it's used in some other capacity, they will have to use it as is, uh, that the building will have to remain as it is. It can be renovated, but not changed and no new structure can be built in the compound around it. Um, so what is going to happen to it? I don't know, uh, it still sits there, it is, uh, gathering dust, it certainly needs a coat of paint. I saw some pictures of the interior of the building recently, and it certainly does need to have some work done to it, but the final disposition remains unknown at this time. Well, at this point, I want to ask uh, my wife, Ila, as I said, a, a real daughter of Wankanair, about some of her thoughts about living in a place that has such a, a significant family connection to her. Uh, it was significant to me, but even more so to her. So I'm going to ask Ela if uh, she might sort of make a few comments now. Excuse me while I sort of shift the uh, attention where it, des it deserves to be. <laughs> Thank you, um, Asiatic Society, for <clears throat> giving me this opportunity. And it is a bit intimidating following our good friend Ken's uh, presentation and Dr. Richter, who are both scholars, and I am just going to speak on a very personal level. So I um, ask you to be a little bit more indulgent. Um, I uh, had um, never thought that we were going to, <coughs> first of all, be opposed to Bombay, which is um, very close to my family's um, history, but even more so, that we would be living in Wakanen House during our posting in Bombay. Um, now that um, is something that I would have never dreamt possible. Um, my um, mother's family, the Kanderias, come from Wakane. We are Katyawaris. 
And I was very much aware as a child growing up that we were proud Katyawaris and very proud to have associations with two places in Katyawar, Rajkot and Wakaner. Rajkot on my father's side and Wakaner on my mother's side. And when um, I was growing up, I was very much aware of all the stories that I heard from my mother about her um, association with Wakane as a child growing up in um, herself in Wakane. However, later on, my mother's father um, left India and uh, settled in South Africa, as in those days, it was not uncommon for um, Gujaratis to venture out well beyond India's borders. So my grandfather, my mother's father settled in South Africa, but even during the time that my mother was growing up in South Africa, the family maintained close ties with Wakane. Wakane was the place where family returned from time to time to celebrate family events such as weddings and such as, you know, um, just family reunions. And my mother was very, very close to her grandmother who remained in Wakane throughout those years. So for them, it was a family matriarch who a kind of uh, deserved to be visited and to be paid respect to. So they were always um, back and forth from South Africa to Wakane. Imagine in those days, what kind of a journey that was. But they did that because they had such strong, strong ties with Wakane. So I have to say that in um, my, you know, later um, incarnation as the wife of an American diplomat, I had um, this opportunity to return to not only to India in a formal capacity, but also to live in Wakane House was something that I would have never thought possible. But even more than me, it was my mother who became uh, so um, proud of the fact that I had um, this renewed connection with Wakane. And I um, must say that although I'd visited Wakane, uh, before with my parents for family weddings and other things. It was um, when we were living in Wakane House that I became even more aware of our connection with Wakane. So I, I have to say that um, that period, the three years that we were living there, were very special to me. And it was particularly significant to me because we had family visit us and they were very much sort of um, awed by the fact that here I was living in that place, which was the home of the princes of their, uh, you know, once considered the Maharaja. And uh, here I was, as my mother would, I'm sure, thought about it as a child growing up in Wakaner when the princes were very much looked up to. And uh, here was her daughter uh, living in the same palace that she would have probably never thought possible for her to be um, able to kind of spend time in. So my mother used to love to come to visit us and even spend days in our residence because this meant a lot to her. And one of the highlights of our stay there was, and, and I say highlights from my perspective, from David's perspective, it was the visit of Clinton and other American um, you know, dignitaries. But for me, the highlight of my stay in Wakane House was the fact that I was able to host a party for my mother on her 90th birthday in Wakane House. Now, this was a very special party because we invited the extended family and friends. And, uh, you know, people showed up more out of curiosity 
in addition to, of course, paying respect to my mother, out of curiosity to see what this famous Wakaner house looked like. And we had a very, very wonderful party. And of course, the, for my mother, the most sort of um, proud moment was the fact that Digvijay Singh, um, the, uh, the prince who during my mother's association with Wakana was just a young boy, had also been invited and he came with his sister and my mother was able to kind of reconnect with them and talk about, you know, her nostalgic memories of his father and grandfather, whom growing up she had been able to um, not only hear about, but had visited the palace with her parents. So this was kind of, it came full circle that we were able to reconnect with this family that my mother had very close ties to. And it was possible because I was living in Makaner house. Unfortunately for us, it was only three years that I was able to stay in that place. I wish I could have stayed there much longer because there were so many more things that I would have been able to reconnect with. But even those three years were very, very special um, and sentimental and our families, my family and the family of the royals of Wakane had re returned to sort of reconnection. And I have to say that it was absolutely uh, the most important posting of our long career in the Foreign Service, at least from my perspective. So I am glad to be able to share these memories with all of you. And I um, am grateful for Ken, to Ken, for giving me this opportunity to share these stories. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. There's a, a, the personal connection to, uh, to Wankaner. Uh, you've been hearing about the political and the uh, geographic and historical significance of the princes of Gujarat, but here you have a, a very personal connection and that we're very proud of and very pleased with. And so once again, we thank Maitri and Ken and all the other speakers for the opportunity of speaking to you today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Good. As historians, we keep on looking for primary sources. Your talk, both of you, was not only inspirational, but I'm sure it also will make for a valuable primary source. So it's, it's extremely important that uh, we heard uh, both of you today and uh, definitely we got your side of the story, as we say. So uh, thank you very much, both of you. And uh, now we cannot end this final session without asking Professor McLeod, Jaivappa, and Bill Richter to speak on Jaivappa's father, the Maharaja of Rangadra. Sure, why don't I start? Um, yeah, I, I first got to know His Highness by mail in the early 1980s. I just wrote to him on a whim, see if he could give me information on princely states, which interested me. Um, that started a con uh, correspondence that lasted right up until his death in 2011, uh, first of all by mail, then by email. Um, he was a, uh, to a large extent, he was responsible for pushing me to do my PhD thesis on the princely states of Gujarat. Uh, Ken may not remember this, but he was also the one who first put Ken and me in touch. And this was sometime in the 1980s. I think that Ken had written to his highness uh, asking for advice, and his highness said, you must get into John McLeod. So, uh, um, and he was a, he was a... I will be up forever grateful. Yeah, yes, yes, definitely. It's like, because that's, we've now been friends a long time as well. He was a, a, an amazing person, a brilliant person, a real polymath, um, and uh, yeah, and, and a very enjoyable person to spend time with as well. I would add that uh, yesterday, uh, Jayavapa mentioned that uh, uh, this highness had been uh, a teacher to us, uh, John, uh, mm -hmm. and I uh, 
and you started listing other people. And I, I think it is probably the case that he was the, uh, the, the guru to a, uh, a whole generation of scholars on South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, not mm -hmm. only American scholars like uh, ourselves, and I guess uh, uh, U.S. and Canadian. Uh, is, if that, is that correct, John? Right. Yes, uh, yes that is correct. Uh, and, but also uh, the uh, 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 French author uh, Christiana Herting uh, mm -hmm. uh, mentions him fondly in her book on uh, the Maharajas. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Ian think, Copeland uh, as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that his role as a, uh, as, as a preserver and conveyor of the heritage of princely India uh, is something that uh, deserves a lot more uh, uh, attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think Jaya Bapa has talked about something very, very important yesterday and today, which is, is the question of whether these Maharajas should represent a, a segment of the population as political figures, or should they re represent the whole area or a particular clan in general? And uh, should they be in a divisive situation where they would have power or do they symbolically, are they in a sense, the unifiers of particular traditions? Yeah, I, I mean, I speak for a little bit about my father, how, what he considered himself. He was a minor when he came and he had only seven years before. He was Raj Pramuk at the age of 23 and uh, with because the Jam Sahib Digvijay Singh Ji went on to the United Nations and uh, so uh, he was involved with Sadar Patel and uh, VP Menon wrote about him. But the most important factor was uh, they were, Jam Sahib Digvijay Singh Ji is my uh, grand uncle because his sister is married to my grandfather. And in that sense there was a long connection and uh, the Jalas, as Ken had spoken about, and uh, the Jadejas have a long connection uh, of uh, several centuries of ladies from either side uh, impregnating the next or bringing the next rulers to play. Uh, in terms of my father's role, how he saw it and how I see myself as uh, walking in his shoes or trying to follow in his footsteps, is that he, he was considered himself a Varna Guru. He was the Lord of the caste. He was not somebody who represented a particular entity. He was Rajput, yes, but that was uh, the Kshatriya Rajput. His ro role was to serve a Rajput and a Kshatriya has no function other than governance and protection. Protection first, and governance for the protection to be useful. So Varna Guru, Anath Vajra Punjaro, which is the motto of the Jhalas, my Aath is the Admantine center of the helpless, was something he actually lived all his life, whether in, uh, uh, as a prince uh, in British India, as uh, thereafter in his life. And this thing was impregnated in my mind as something that regardless of where my career would take me, I was the, I'm the second son, not uh, destined to be the uh, Jalavar's uh, head. Uh, but he was he also was very keen that there should be a unit unifying element. You're not irrelevant because an outside force determines you're not relevant. If you are relevant in terms of your service uh, to the people then the people are uh, important for you. And so long as you have privilege, and a person like me are entirely privileged, whether we are here as associate professors or uh, living in America or wherever, everything comes from the grain that grew out of the cities and towns and fields and deserts of Jalal. So how do we do this? And how can we do this in the present time is vital. Uh, this is now becoming more and more possible because of the scholarships uh, of uh, you know, John and Bill. Uh, you are laying a foundation and Maitri is now joined the field, so to speak, 
where they are looking at polity as something that is more substantial, more permanent than the floating policies of uh, the politics of any day. Because we know just in the process of history, powers come and go, but as Ken was talking about, the polity, the Hindu dharma, actually there is no Hindu dharma, there is India, and for instance, there is no Hindu dharma that is outside Jain and Buddha and Islam. There has never been an India that is any one of these things. All these things make up uh, this fantastic uh, country that is India or Bharat as people would call it. And I find it very disturbing myself. And this is a personal mission of my own that for the rest of my life uh, uh, that we should work towards dissipating this notion of divide. People who live on this earth of, of India have a place. But of course there is a notion about who determines this. Politics has become very unfortunate because it split people and uh, brothers are now fighting brothers because they are with the BJP or the Congress or some other party. So polity, uh, the, the irony is that Democracy which has come to empower the people is taking a certain form that is not bonding people. Uh, that is my sense. I'm not a political scientist like Bill. But this is based on my observations. I may live in America, but I'm a constant visitor every year to Drangadra and to other parts of, uh, of Jalawar as well as uh, Sabrashtra and India. But uh, in terms of where is the, how I was talking to Bill just before we begin talking now, but how can we strategize for the future? How can we make for a better polity? And this may not be a, a scholar's work, but scholars are by implication involved in shaping thinking. And so if you are all involved in it, the future will be shaped by what you write. And uh, Maitri was talking about in one of the earlier lectures, how do we remember? Why remember? What is the purpose of remembrance? Is, is it simply to forget and to remember what we ought to want to promote? That is in fact leads to what I would call uh, a separation or bifurcation or uh, the destruction of a polity. The unification that has happened miraculously as it has, there is something that is to be admired and to build upon. So maybe I said more, to more than I should. Didn't say it, enough, but but I think this is where Maitri has had so much to 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 really do because I think the importance of Sayaji Rao as a national figure and a national model of how somebody goes beyond politics, beyond communities, to create a an evolving thing where you're not getting rid of tradition you're bringing tradition together and you're moving forward in a modernizing way an alternate center of modernization and i think she is doing that and she's also not forgetting that you can't really eliminate half of the population and that indians have had a way of incorporating women but now women have to come to the fore and that's only going to come if we talk, if they can build upon the models of some of the, in business and in uh, royal politics that some of uh, their ancestors did the women. So thank you, Maitri. Absolutely. So not only uh, the efforts that we are making, especially I, and I think Professor Avasti is here, is to write them back in the historical discourse. Because to believe that 50% uh, of the population was not really because it was not in power, so it was not really doing anything of significance because they were not in the public spaces, it does not mean that they were not important enough. So we really uh, look at uh, even the smallest of the clues, you know, we want to just assess evidences and we want to write them, write about them, write about these women. So therefore our inquiry is essentially connected with this idea of making the women visible in every 
uh, aspect. So British India, of course, there are many scholars who have focused their attention on writing them back. But so far as princely states or Indian states are concerned, already the states are marginalized. Their discourses are marginalized. They are far and few. And uh, on top of it, if you look at the women, they are absolutely absent. So the, it's, it's, it's important that we don't repeat the mistakes of the earlier historians or schools of thought, wherein they uh, wrote about men and then they brought women into the mainstream. What we intend to do here is, I especially, this is what I'm going to dedicate my life to, is to write women back, and especially the women of princely states. So yes, Maharajas uh, were important, their policies were important, the kind of... Uh, uh, administrative structures that they had set up was important, but so were the women. So why is it that they are absent even from those marginalized categories? So that's what we are, uh, Aruna Avasti, Professor Aruna Avasti, she's actually my mentor. So it was under her that I trained. I, I had to be trained because she's the one who's floated uh, a course on women's studies in our department. And she's in fact, one of the leading historians working from Western India on women's history. So I think both of us are, uh, and there are many other scholars who have joined us in this whole search for women and we continue to work in the field. And I'm glad that we got to meet uh, uh, Ina Ma'am and uh, I'm glad that we got to listen to her and her experiences because no matter what, you know, no matter, she's not the council gen uh, general, but she's equally important. What she does and her experiences are equally important. And I think, uh, Ila ma'am, we would be contacting you more for uh, for whatever, you know, I would want my students to contact you and, you know, maybe have an interview with you so that um, we get to know uh, what actually happened. So it's, it's we are not looking for uh, what the English were looking for. We are not looking for uh, problems in the Indian society. We are not looking at sati system or we are not looking at female infanticide. What we are looking at is, the actual lives of women and what was important for them. So if this is history, I'm, I, I'm not really doing justice to the title, but I'm calling it his story. Now we want to write her story. So in all of this, women have to speak. They have to be present. Have you been in touch with Barbara Ramasak at the University of Cincinnati? I have read... Barbara? I have, yeah, I don't know her, but I have read her books. I, we can put you in touch. Yeah, okay. and uh, she she has been interested not only in princely India, but also in women in history. And uh, so I, I think you would enjoy following up on that uh, shared Absolutely. interest. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that piece of information. And, and how do we keep this as in the center, women in the center of things? Because when you look at Professor Awashki's work, it's not only about women, it's about railroads. You know, railroads are not women. And if we talk about it only in terms of women's things, we're, we're saying that women don't enter into the general discourse and don't play a, a role in other issues. It has to be a woman's Thank issue. Yes. It has to be a woman's issues that has to be addressed, plus the general issues. And only somebody like Professor Washke, who's doing both, can see the balance between the two. And if, if I could uh, shift, uh, I, I want at least to mention uh, in appreciation of the goods, uh, the, uh, David, I, I don't know whether our paths ever crossed in India, but uh, I, we certainly enjoyed the work of the U.S. Foreign Service there and especially USIS. Uh, we were privileged to, to participate in USIS University uh, seminars all over India and uh, in fact a lot of the places where we were able to visit with uh, princes was at the uh, was was a result of the generosity of USIS and in, in helping us to be speakers in those places and so uh, I, I want to uh, express appreciation for the sort of work that you and your colleagues have done. Thank you very much I appreciate that my my career was actually with the USIS. It was only in the last uh, uh, eight or 10 years of my foreign service career that I shifted over to the State Department. But USIS is where my 
career began in Bahá'u'lláh House in Delhi and where my heart always was. And it always uh, makes me feel good to know that people like you appreciated the work that uh, was done over those many years. Thank you. And I can remember visiting Bahá'u'lláh House uh, at least in 65. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, it was, it was sometime in the early 70s, I think, that USIS shifted from there to uh, uh, a newer facility on Barakamba Road or uh, on, on Kasturba Gandhi. Kastur, uh, Gandhi yeah. That's right, yes. That's right, yeah. And the building is now, I think, uh, the Government of India building, some kind of an archive building, I believe now. But it was a wonderful place so. to, to begin a career. Uh, I, I think I would like to add uh, my three. You, I, I don't know if you met my daughter or communicated with her, but she's a professor of history. And uh, she's written about uh, princely matters as well as in, uh, in Western India. I have, I have bought her work. I have, I have read. I have read her work. I'm well, quite impressed with it. And I think I will now get in touch with her. Okay, good, good. Uh, she is... Uh, uh, teaching at this moment, but uh, I'm sure there'll be occasion enough. Gee. And Professor Avasti, thank you for yeah, your your role in all of this. And uh, uh, thank you. I, I hope you in, you are still the head of the department there. Correct. Oh. Muted. You're muted. Oh. You're muted. You're oh. muted. Hello. Can you hear yes, me hi. now? Yes, Hello, hi. everyone. Hello. Yes. Thank you, Bill, very much. And I also got to read uh, the email that you had sent to Metri. And uh, I do seriously feel that a lot of work needs to be done in gender studies. And uh, I'm very much interested in bringing to light the role that uh, royal princesses played. I feel they have been neglected a lot. And uh, I think that so-called the inner circles, what you call the Zanana, uh, I think most of the decisions took place there. And nobody is, uh, you know, bringing to light the vision that they gave. And probably it may just have been a suggestion, but the way it gets translated when the ruler takes it to the court. So I really wish that, uh, and I hope all of you will stand by us and help us when Maitri and I really want to work on this so that we are able to give a gendered history, not just half history. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. And thank you for, uh, I, I gather that some of the participants uh, are, are your students. And, uh, oh, yes. Appreciate them being a part of this uh, discussion uh, last week and this. Thank you, Bill. And we all really need to keep in touch so that we can carry this forward and not just stop it here. Thank you. Uh, I, I invite you, I, I invite both of you ladies to consider uh, the Drangadra Palace as a territory where you can bring your students. I've had the privilege for 20 years to bring my students from the US and Europe, as well as some people from Baroda and others have come uh, for the summer programs. But uh, it would be wonderful uh, for, especially for understanding about architecture. Now, of course, the Zanana does not exist with, in the way it did earlier. But nonetheless, there's much there to be learned. And sure, it, definitely. Yeah. We will we do you will teach you. Do you have oh. a summer program or do you have a program when you take students on a particular Maybe. Program? Uh, yeah, maybe with your permission, can we take the questions? Certainly. Okay. So the first uh, question is by Irina. She's been there. Uh, throughout these sessions and uh, in fact in the very first session she had asked this question so she's repeating this question and I hope that she finds an answer not from me though 
So she's asking uh, that, uh, has anybody come across Vernon and company photographers and publishing publishers, a company which was known as a manufacturer of photo albums for many princely states in Gujarat. So the time period that she's giving is from 1900s to 1920s. I will help her uh, with this, with thanks to my own collection and with uh, to introduce her to the proper uh, collectors. And I know Irina, so, and by the way, she's also working on the next thing, which is on pilgrimage. So the next question is by Sudeep. Uh, so he's, he's a student of ours and he's asking, can we call the Chamber of Princess a body akin to the League of Nations? Since, since it appears that bigger states like Baroda, Hyderabad were not involved in that body. He's, because I, he feels that it was redundant. It really did not, it was not able to achieve much. I'm not sure I would go that far. I think it did achieve, for the states that were participants in it, it was the, for the first time in a hundred years, the rulers getting together, uh, determining common problems that they had, all kinds of things like that. Um, I could also, um, his late highness of Drangadra also saw it very much as a predecessor of the Concord, the prince's organization in the 1960s and 1970s. So I think just as being a forum that would bring rulers together, even if not all of them were involved, um, I think it did serve a, a very important purpose. And, and what, what you said before, Maitri, I think was very important that uh, not everything depends on political entities. You talk about this in terms of economic history, the business communities. But here, I think that the experience that people like uh, Dick Vijay and uh, Ranji had created a sense of, of India as a polity, the representation of India uh, with uh, Ganga Singh uh, created this idea of Indians as international citizens and as representing all of India. If I could uh, mention an article that Barbara Ramasak and I published in the Journal of Asian Studies in 1975, I think it was, entitled The Chamber and the Consultation. Uh, we draw some of those connections between the, the chamber and, and then the, what was called the Concord later. And I might mention that uh, His Highness Drangadra uh, uh, read the manuscript and gave us valuable corrections and uh, uh, made us, especially made us correct some of our terminology that we thought was not appropriate. So, so uh, but anyhow, that, that uh, does provide some of that connection. Absolutely. I think the next question was in connection to this one, which was like, what were the achievements of Chamber of Princes? But I think we have sufficiently answer, uh, answered this question. And in case if someone really wants to know more, can, should buy our books, which are going to be available soon on pothi.com. So I'm going to be the ambassador or maybe the... <laughs> so <laughs> please do uh, buy the volumes. They are beautiful. And uh, even if you're not interested in reading too much, you can simply look at the photographs and I'm sure it's, it's like a journey in itself. So um, uh, before we hand over... I hand over the charge to the hosts. Uh, I think I have to say this, that uh, it has been a great privilege to be given this opportunity to speak on our books before this distinguished audience. And therefore we extend our sincerest gratitude to the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, Mumbai Research Center. We are also uh, thankful to the government of India for sponsoring the lecture series as a part of their incredible India initiative. Uh, India is one of the oldest civilizations in the world, although it's not still recognized by many. But uh, nonetheless, I think with time, it will prove itself. And it is, as I think we already have discerned, it's a mosaic of multicultural experience. It has a rich cultural heritage and attractions. And in fact, we can say that the country is amongst the most popular tourist destinations in the world. And the sponsorship has made it uh, possible for young scholars and budding historians to listen to the eminent speakers. Believe me when I say this, but the lecture series have helped the aspiring PhD scholars to understand the importance of history of regional states. So I think at least I feel quite satisfied that a part of the job that I had taken upon myself has been 
done to a certain extent, limited but definite extent. We would specifically like to thank Dr. Shehrnaz Nallawala and Ramesh uh, Gauri Raghavan for facilitating this virtual platform and guiding us logistically every step of the way. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. Now I hand over the calls to the hosts. Yeah, before she says, I have I have almost missed out thanking the participants. Uh, they have been wonderful and uh, they were quite diligently joining us uh, promptly every day and asking the most relevant questions and giving their valuable suggestions. So I think uh, we have benefited a lot from the question answer session. So I have to thank them. I'm sorry for butting in, but I had to say this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Robbins. Thank you, Professor Submis, for such a treat, you know. For seven days, you really, you know, uh, made us look forward to the evening when we were wanting to hear each of y'all. So thank you so much. Um, my thanks, special thanks to India Tourism for stepping in and allowing this series to be accessible to all. You know, as you said, your PhD students could partake. Everyone could partake, anyone who was interested. And this was made possible only because of the very generous sponsorship that came from them. Also, the YouTube links that now, which will be available to everyone, will allow people who could not uh, be present during this series to listen to them during their free time. So, you know, so many different people are going to benefit from the scholarship that was offered through these uh, lectures. So, a very, very big thank you to India Tourism and especially to Mr. Venkatesan, who really, very, you know, it was an effortless uh, Think getting sponsorship from them. Otherwise, generally we have to chase people for sponsorship. Just one letter and everything was done. So really, thank you very, very much for this. Um, from the historical perspectives to the narratives, you know, personal narratives, like, oh. you know, the historical research to personal narratives, you know, the series had something for everyone. So thank you so much, you know. There was a, a whole lot of variety in the series, you know. The visuals were beautiful. Everything was almost perfect. So thank you, thank you so much for this. Thank you to all the speakers, Kenneth, Maitri, John, Mitch, Bill, Vinny, Taruna, Jaya Singhji, Mil, Trafar, Moin, David and Ila. Thank you, thank you so much. And please, I think, uh, there's an open invitation from the Asiatic for you all to speak at, or, or at, on any occasion, anything that you would like us to arrange for you all we would be most happy to do so. And as Maitri has said that she is going to do something on gender and, you know, uh, making the invisible women visible, I think you have an open invitation from us. We would love to have a second session with you all on the women of the princely state. So please, the floor is all yours. You can contact us anytime and we'll have another very, very interesting series that will now focus on women. So... Please keep us in mind anytime you would like to run this series with us. You know? And um, yeah, on behalf of the ASM also, I would like to say that, you know, um, you know, we'd like to explore more things with you. So maybe, you know, we'd like to, we'll be contacting you. Ramesh and I have also been pondering about where to contact whom for what. And uh, soon you will find us contacting you. And I hope you will be able to do many more series with us. Us. Thank you. Um, for a series like this to take, um, you know, shape and, you know, the way it was successfully conducted, a big thank you to so many people from the Mumbai Research Center who just stepped in um, at every moment, you know. Uh, sometimes we were not available to run the technical part and a big thank you, therefore, to Arun, Anaita, Wiplo and Venkatesh who thank very you. took over the role of um, admins and things like that and made this uh, very smooth flowing series possible. Uh, this series would not, not have been possible without Ramesh. You know, Ramesh was the coordinator, Ramesh ideated, everything was about Ramesh. So I think as Professor Robbins is giving a thumbs up, I'm giving thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up to Ramesh. So thank you, Ramesh, and I hope your enthusiasm never wanes, you know. When our enthusiasm is flagging, Ramesh always steps in and, you know, takes us along. along. So, uh, a very, very big thank you. 
Thank you to all members of the MRC because during the two years of COVID, it's really everyone has stepped in and we've had non-stop programs over two years in terms of so many, many lecture series. So I think this is just teamwork and I thank everyone for it. The office staff at the Asiatic is wonderful. So sending of the emails, a special thank you to Denzil um, and the others who used to pitch in whenever Denzil was not available. So I think this series is all about teamwork, about all of y'all, you know, the flawless coordination between the speakers, the very, very good um, uh, companionship amongst the MRC members. Thank you very much. And of course, without the participants, nothing would have been possible. So it's thank you, thank you, and thank you all. And hope to see all of y'all again.